Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are going to talk about the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund's core program called Seed a Legacy and take a deep dive into what we do, how we do it, and how you can become involved. So um, to get us started, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Amanda Allen and I am the Director of Development here at the BBHF. I've been with the organization for just a little bit over a year now. I live in Pennsylvania, our newest state in the Seed a Legacy program. Um, behind the scenes tonight, we also have our wonderful marketing and communications director, Lindsay Huber, who's coming to you from South Dakota. So let's go ahead and test out those Zoom reactions and give Lindsay some love. Um, she will be putting some important information in the chat throughout the night, so watch for that. Oh, look at all those hearts. Perfect. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please drop us a note in the chat. Tell us your name where you're located, um, are you a landowner, a partner in the field, a donor, or just a curious follower. Um, and then we're gonna use the Q&A section just for questions later. So if you wanna tell us about yourself, put it in the chat. If you have a question throughout the session tonight, go ahead and put it in the Q&A section. And if we can't answer it, we will behind the scenes. And then at the very end, we'll have a session with um, live Q&A for Elsa. Um, if you have questions that don't pertain directly to Seed a Legacy, please email info at beandbutterflyfund.org or if it's something related to donations and fundraising, send it to me at donate at beandbutterflyfund.org. Um, and then I think that's about it. Am I forgetting anything, Elsa? Nope, I think nope? you got okay. it. Uh, we're ready to get started, so I'm going to welcome our Habitat Program Dr Director, Elsa Gallagher, who will be leading our discussion tonight. So go ahead and take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself. I certainly will. I'm excited to be here tonight, for one. Um, I've been a biologist uh, most of my career. Well, shoot, all of my career, I guess. Uh, working with private landowners, which I absolutely love. And working for the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, uh, we're a not-for-profit that we're dedicated to trying to provide great habitat for pollinators and trying to reverse some of the declines we've seen in pollinator habitat. So when I am not um, working on pollinator habitat projects or working with landowners, then I absolutely love um, prescribed fire. I like my bird dogs and I spend a lot of time outdoors enjoying the fruits of my labor working on habitat projects. So I'm here tonight. I have probably spent 20, 21 years working with private landowners on habitat projects um, for upland game, for pollinators, and for other wildlife as well. So um, I'm here to help talk you through the Seed Legacy program and talk to you a little bit about what we do at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, how you can become involved in doing more for pollinators where you're at. So what we always say at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is the status quo is not going to get it done. Um, this image that you'll see starts in 2008 and goes through 2021. And what it is, is the honeybee colony loss estimates, the red bar being the annual losses that a beekeeper suffers with their honeybees. And as you can see, we've been increasing the number of losses that we've seen in honeybee colonies. Um, one of the things that we can do to help combat that is work on habitat projects. And that's the Bee and Butterfly Hab Habitat Fund's answer to a lot of the problems that we're having um, out on the landscape is to work on habitat. Uh, the better habitat we have, the less likely any species is to suffer ill effects from other um, outside pressures because they're gonna have great habitat to come back on, um, good food sources, uh, lots of forage for the honeybees. So um, what we've been doing in the past hasn't been working enough. So we are new since 2017 and are working towards a new model, um, some different seed mixtures and working towards getting a lot more habitat on the ground as, a, as an organization. If you look at what we've seen in grassland songbirds since the 1970s, 
Um, just an example of, of a grassland shrubland species is the bobwhite quail, which occurs in, in most places that you, that folks here are listening to us from, I imagine. Um, but we've seen almost um, an 80% decline in bobwhite quail populations. And a lot of the songbirds um, have also declined, the, the grasshopper sparrow, uh, Henslow sparrow. Um, you know, we've just seen a lot of declines in those birds as well. So same kind of thing, habitat losses are having an effect on not just our pollinators, but also on other species um, that use that same habitat type. If you take a look at this graph, uh, this comes from Monarch Watch. Um, the monarch butterfly, as many of you know or don't know, um, looks pretty certain that there's going to be a decision made about listing the monarch butterfly as an endangered species in the coming year. Um, we're not 100% sure that they're going to be listed, but uh, it's it's looking fairly likely. So there's just some major concerns there. We've seen declines since the early 90s. Um, and it just, I mean, they've lost over 80% of their population. Um, and it's just a, it's kind of an iconic species. I, I certainly, you know, we raised caterpillars when I was in middle school um, in my science class. And I imagine many of you as well. And they've just become a species that we're used to seeing. And it's just the fact that they're so, so far gone now and the populations have declined so rapidly um, is just a real concern and has been a concern for many, many years for wildlife conservationists. We really believe that working on better quality habitat projects for all the pollinators, including the monarch butterfly, is the way to go. So that's uh, why we developed the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. If you take a look at, we'll talk a little bit about where we're located as the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Um, if you look at this monarch butterfly fall and spring migrations, so the green are the migrations that they, as they go north, they come out of Mexico and they start moving north as it starts getting warmer. Um, they lay their eggs in, let's say, Texas. Um, then that monarch butterfly dies. Those eggs hatch. Then that butterfly flies up to, say, uh, Missouri, right in the middle of our map here. Um, then it lays an egg and then it dies. And then that butterfly flies up, uh, say, to South Dakota and then lays an egg and dies. Well, then that butterfly flies back down to Mexico to the little star that you see in the bottom. That's the Oyamel fir forest in Mexico. And that's where that fourth generation butterfly who is, um, you know, three generations removed from anybody that ever knew anything about the Oyamel fir forest in Mexico, uh, flies all the way back there and um, overwinters there and then starts the whole process again, moving up through the upper Midwest. So as you can see, that's a real important area for us as we look at um, the Eastern uh, monarch migration route. Uh, this is a map <clears throat> uh, years ago, the Fish and Wildlife Service put together a map on, uh, they call it a heat map of where these priority areas are for the monarch butterfly. And you can see the upper Midwest over into Pennsylvania, our newest state, um, is, is the area that they really think we should target for nectar producing plants and common milkweed, which is the number one plant necessary for the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Over 90% of monarch caterpillars are raised on a common milkweed plant. Not, not another milkweed plant, a common milkweed plant. So that's the one that we try to include in, and uh, try to get good numbers on you know, where we're putting them in the landscape. So our solution at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund for putting together great habitat for all kinds of different species um, is putting high quality, diverse pollinator habitat on the ground. And we do that through our program called the Seed a Legacy Program. We provide seed mixes uh, and technical guidance for people as they work through the process. Now, this is our main program through the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. It's not our only program, but it is our main program. And as I said, we just added Pennsylvania. So you can see that uh, 
those folks that are here will recognize their state. <laughs> and we are really excited about that. We have one project uh, we piloted last year in the state uh, with the uh, North American Land Trust, uh, the Britain Run Preserve Project, really interesting project. It's an old battleground and it's a, it's a great project and they've been wonderful to work with. And they've, uh, they're have they putting two more projects on the ground this next year in Pennsylvania. And Amanda just attended the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association meeting and just had some really great, made some really great people that are really interested in doing habitat projects. So we already have a list in Pennsylvania of, of folks that are interested in, in doing plantings this fall. So we're really excited about that. Seeds already being shipped out the door for new projects in Pennsylvania. So since we started in 2017, we have put almost 5,000 acres of pollinator habitat on the ground, almost 17 million milkweed seeds. And it's just, you know, we've had a lot of successes with the program and we're really excited to be able to bring it to a couple more states, uh, Pennsylvania being the newest one for us. Our other program that we just started this year is the Solar Synergy Program. We've had a lot of interest from companies that are doing solar development about trying to do something else for pollinators while they're putting in these solar projects. Um, many of you I'm sure have seen the solar projects where there's just gravel underneath or just a dense mat of like fescue or some monoculture grass. And we think we can do better than that. And we think there's a lot of potential out there for these projects that are already going in the ground for us to provide good quality habitat underneath the panels. And the unique part about our program is that we also work to put a more diverse mixture outside of the panels. So we're also putting in a taller, more diverse 30 plus species mix outside the panels to provide additional habitat for pollinators in addition to the already um, diverse underneath the panels, the under the array mixes that we do, which generally are a kind of a clover based mixture. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this program. It's going to be big. These are uh, utility scale projects. So you're thinking of things in the, you know, thousand acre range um, that are already going in the ground. And we are just trying to make them more beneficial to pollinators as they're putting these, um, these on the ground. And they'll be doing a lot of, we'll be doing some carbon sequestration monitoring, pollinator and habitat monitoring. And each of those sites will be connected with a commercial beekeeper so that we can go ahead and um, put them in touch with, with an area that they can use to, to help grow their hives and uh, to uh, produce more honey. So we're pretty excited about that part of it too. And the solar companies are very excited about that part of it. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to the solar synergy program as it grows. So I was just showing you a couple pictures here. We have uh, some of, uh, this is our old sign, our next gen conservation habitat sign. As you saw in some of the first ones, you would have seen a, a wider sign that you're gonna get if you sign up for your program. Um, Amanda has designed us some new signs that I think are really cool. Uh, so here's the details about the Seed Legacy program. We provide pollinator seed mixtures for free for the Seed Legacy program. Any project is eligible if it's two acres or larger. Now, if you don't have two acres and your neighbor has an acre and you have an acre and you want to put two together, we've been known to do that in the past. Uh, we have a an area with a church uh, and then a landowner that we worked with. The church had an acre, the landowner had an acre. We put in one of each of our mixes on that acre. Um, it, it's open to private, public, or corporate lands. Our online application process is real simple. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one technical guidance. So you're gonna talk to me about your project. You're gonna talk to me about the site prep, and then I'm gonna give you some recommendations for how to manage that site, how to plant it, and how to manage it in the future. And one of the things we have for that is a pollinator habitat establishment guide, which we've worked on and, and are still revamping. Um, it's a pretty good tool, I think, to help you get through the process as well. Now, I wanted to talk to you about some of the things that we have found that projects that are very successful have in common. Number one is a well-designed seed mixture. Provides uh, good density, good duration, good bloom. Uh, thorough site preparation, 
if you do the site preparation correctly, you are so far ahead of the curve. If you do site preparation incorrectly, or maybe it'll be good enough, maybe I've gotten rid of enough of the grass, maybe that Canada thistle or Cerecia lespides is really gone, but it's not. Um, if you have those things, um, you know, we can always, almost always look back to any project that wasn't successful and go back to site prep. Uh, so for us, site prep is really, really, really important on all of our projects. And of course, that puts the onus on you as a landowner to do a really good job of it. But we try to help talk you through it and, and help you get through it. Um, seeding the site correctly, of course, is important. Maintaining it the first year when all the annual weeds want to come up and and just take over your entire native planting is important as well. So we help you through that too. And then following up on any of the invasives like we talked about, um, uh, just so that you can control those before they get out of control on your site. And those are the things that our successful projects have in common. I wanna talk to you a little bit more about our seed mixtures, just because that's part of what makes us unique as an organization. And the first part of what makes us so unique, as you can see, the more diverse planting here um, in the orange, that is all, what we call our monarch mix or our native mix. Now the purple planting with the bee on it, that is what we call our bee mix, our honeybee mix. We plant every single project that we do, whether it's a solar project or a sea legacy project, every project we do is planted to two different seed mixtures. And much like this picture, they are planted separately. They do not overlap. Uh, they may touch each other, but they do not overlap. We do not mix the seed together. Um, that's because our bee mixture will often um, try and grow very quickly. It establishes very quickly, and it, and it will kind of take over the native planting, which establishes much slower and needs a lot more elbow room as it establishes. So the native planting part um, needs to be planted separately from, a, uh, from our from our uh, honeybee part, just because it, it can't compete so quickly. It takes it two or three years to establish before the plants really get going. So again, that uh, native part's not gonna look so beautiful the first couple of years. But after that, boy, it's gonna be a wowser like this picture. So this is what the honeybee mix looks like. And I just used an example of, of Pennsylvania being our newest state. Um, several species of clover, um, and a few other species, but for the most part, it's a, it's a lot of clover. What I encourage people to do is use this kind of as a green fire break. If you're ever gonna use prescribed fire on the, on the site, it works really, really well as a green fire break. Um, it's also really attractive to deer. Uh, the honeybees love this, as do the bumblebees. Um, our most recent bu bumblebee survey in Missouri found bumblebees on clover more than any other species. And so we do know that native bumblebees also use the clover mix that we have established here um, very, very much exclusively in the, in the summertime when it's blooming. So this is a, an example of our monarch mix. This is also the Pennsylvania monarch mix. And you, as you can see, versus the other one. Um, I'm gonna talk you through this one a little bit. So if we move from the left side, let's just, we're gonna pick clasping coneflower in the middle of the page because it's got a lot of space around it. So clasping coneflower, we move over to the right, it's scientific name. Then we go to the PLS, pure live seed pounds per acre and seeds per square foot. Now that's an important number because we base a lot of what we do on seeds per square foot, trying to get somewhere around the 40 for our Monarch mix, 40 seeds per square foot. We found that to be most effective um, in giving the natives enough room to grow and we're not getting them over, you know, choking them out with uh, too many seeds. And then you move over to the bloom period. Now one is early, two is middle of the summer, and then three is our late season bloomers like these days. It would be um, like your goldenrods uh, will be late bloomers. Um, cardinal flower right above this one um, is a bloom period for the three. That's a little more of a wet, a wet species, but cardinal flower here uh, blooms also later in the year. And then you can see um, over here, 
We've also got a pollinator score for this species. So um, the Clacton coneflower is a two, so it's not very high on the pollinator score, but it provides a lot of other um, visual properties for us that we really like on the sites. And we don't include it at a really high, uh, at a high rate. But as you can see, there's different species that goes all the way up to five. And we try to shoot for somewhere between four and five for our pollinator score for each of our uh, seed mixes. And so this is half of the monarch mix. And I'm gonna show you the other half here. So here's the other half of the monarch mix for Pennsylvania. And what you'll see on the bottom here where it says total mixture, that's seven pounds of pure live seed per acre. We move over here to the number 38.04, that is 38 seeds per square foot. And then the pollinator value is right down here on the right, 4.22, so above four. And then wildflowers used in the mixture, I'll show you, we've got six that are blooming early. The early bloomers are hard to find sometimes, and so are the late bloomers. So there's, we did a really good job on this mix, getting it to where we have 13 species that are blooming at the end of the year. Ask any uh, beekeeper, because those folks pay really close attention to what's blooming in August and September, and even into October. Um, and usually we can't find very many species that are giving us a good bloom at that time of the year. Now you could ask the monarch butterflies if they care what's blooming in uh, August and September. And I'll ask you if you know what's happening in August and September and October. That is when those migrating butterflies are going back to Mexico and they need the nectar resources to get all the way back. So it is important that we try and work on that. Um, the 18 that uh, species of wildflowers that bloom in June and July, you know, that we always have a lot that are blooming in the middle of the summer. So, um, so we try and worry more about what we're doing early and what we're doing late in our seed mixtures. And this one's a really nice one for the late season uh, species. And I just wanted to put this, this is how we develop that pollinator value score. Um, I'll, I'll let you read through it, um, but it's there's just a list of things that we keep in mind when we're developing a pollinator score for every species that we include in our seed mixtures. So I wanna show you a few results. Uh, we've, there've been a few independent research projects that have been um, tasked with taking a look at our seed mixtures. And I wanna just show you some preliminary results. And then we've got one study that was fully completed. So I can give you some of the uh, not preliminary, but already published results there. The first one is a grad student out of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, her name is Cheyenne Lindsay. She's spoken at several beekeeping meetings in the past two years about this research project that she's doing. She did this for, um, for her degree there. And what she found was that our Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund projects had more species diversity in native bumblebees than the surrounding area. And she found several species um, that were not very common in the state on our bee and butterfly habitat plantings. So we're excited about that. So that again, this is one of the preliminary uh, projects. She hasn't published anything yet, but we're hoping to see some of her data in the future uh, about our seed a legacy project sites in Nebraska. Um, this is a project out of Dan Caribou's native bee lab in Minnesota called the MAP program. And what they ended up working on was um, they had 38 pollinator research plots and a portion of those wore bee and butterfly habitat fund um, seed legacy seed mixtures. Um, we call those seed mixtures next gen. We call those the next gen seed mixtures. And that's because we developed those based on all those pollinator scores that you saw earlier. And uh, they're engineered to be pollinator friendly specifically. Um, that's our number one interest in our next gen seed mixtures is making them pollinator friendly. So what they found, they had five species of bees that were new records to Minnesota. And that doesn't mean they weren't ever found anywhere else, but they were found new in Minnesota. And the only sites that they found these on were our Seed Legacy next gen sites. 
so where the next gen mixes uh, were planted. So we're pretty excited about that. That shows us that what we're doing is working for bees, uh, honeybees as well as native bees. And this research project was out of um, North Dakota, uh, the uh, USGS, uh, Clint Auto and Autumn Smart worked on this project. And what they looked at was all these different habitat types and all there's three different graphs that you're going to see and they're, they're going to be all exactly the same as this one. They looked at roadside habitat. They looked at pastures, other grasslands. They looked at national wildlife refuge properties. They looked at CRP or conservation reserve program plantings. And then they looked at our engineered next gen seed mixtures, the bee and butterfly habitat seed mixtures. And this one is a uh, honeybee use. And you can see that we had mm, three times as much honeybee visits per transect as the next closest, which was on the National Wildlife Refuge in this case. Um, so that shows me some good information about these engineered next gen uh, seed mixtures. This one was the number of flowering species per transect on all the same roadside pasture, wildlife refuge, conservation reserve program. And what we found was the bee and butterfly habitat, the next gen seed mixtures had twice as many flowers per transect as the next closest, which was in that case, CRP. And then the next one is my favorite. I won't give it up, so I'll just show it to you. Okay, native bee flower visits by land use. So it's so all the same as, as the last ones, except that there were eight times more native bee visits to our next gen habitat seed mixture sites than there were to the next closest, which was conservation reserve program plantings. So uh, what that shows me is that this is working. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about the results that we're seeing from a lot of independent research. Uh, this project was actually uh, a project that they worked on for USDA to take a look at the, the CRP plantings and what they were seeing with bee use. So uh, pretty neat they got us in there and we're able to look at some of our sites as well. Um, I wanted to throw this quote in here. Our One of our co-founders of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is a gentleman named Zach Browning. Um, Zach, if you haven't met Zach Browning and you know anything about honey and honey production, he's a good guy to meet and spend a little time with. Um, it'll make your brain hurt a little bit because he is super smart. But uh, I asked him about his beekeeping and what the Seed of Legacy program and these next gen seed mixtures have done for him. And he, I wrote it down word for word. He said he's utterly convinced that it's the best thing for his bees. And and I was on his site when he was giving this quote. Um, you can't walk through it without kicking up a pheasant. Um, as I was walking through his site, I actually got up a brood. So there were five pheasant chicks and a hen, and there could have been more. I just that was what I saw. Um, but there's something that you can do now. I mean. We talk about a lot of different things as a beekeeper that you can do and you can improve the health of your bees and your hives. Uh, this is something else that you can do. You can improve their forage and you can improve it for monarch butterflies and upland songbirds while you're doing that. So it's a, it's a pretty neat program, I think, that we have. Pretty unique. So we talked about well-designed seed mixtures. The rest of this, the rest of the story is the site prep, getting it seeded, the maintenance, and then following up, of course, on your invasives. And one of the things that we developed for you to help with that, and this little QR code thing works, if you put your phone right up here on that, it'll take you to our a pollinator habitat guide. And our pollinator habitat guide is a 50 some page document that helps talk you through how to do your site prep correctly, how to seed your site, uh, it's a pretty helpful tool, I think. And there's a lot of videos in there. There's links to videos that will help you um, answer a few questions like, when do I mow? How do I mow? Um, what happens if grass is trying to overtake my site? What do I do then? Um, there, we've got video links in there that will help you answer some of those questions. So um, if you're a DIY, do-it-yourself kind of person, 
this guide probably would get you there. Um, and if you need a little more help, then I'm there to help you. But this is how you work with us. I kind of made a little thing here on how you work with us. Read the habitat guide, get a little information there. Decide on what you're gonna do for your site preparation because there's a lot of different options. You can do a lot of different things to get that site prepared. Uh, we, we have our favorite plan and that involves um, using soybeans as a site prep tool. It does a lot of things. It provides really great bare ground. It provides bare ground that's ready to seed in the fall, which we prefer to do. And it also, because uh, soybeans fix nitrogen in the soil, it also gives that pollinator planting a little boost because of that uh, additional nitrogen that's been um, stored in the, in the soil. Um, so that's one of the ways, but there's a lot of different ways you can get your site ready. So you decide on your site preparation methods. We have an interest form that you can fill out and says, hey, I'm interested in doing a project. I'm going to work on the site prep. Um, and then we'll connect with you uh, and set up a time to talk and get your project going for you. And then we send you the seed pretty much. Once your site's fully prepared, we, we send you the seed. You get it via UPS or FedEx. I believe we have a few folks on here who receive their seed today. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and usually there's a couple of signs that say be in Butterfly Habitat Fund with your, with your seed. Uh, and then we'll continue to help follow up with any questions you have about the site as you get it planted and as you start to manage it because this is a site that should be good to go for the next 20 years if you get it planted well. This, this is an example of what your timeline might look like. It, and this, it uses the soybean example, but that's just the one I have in the, in the uh, habitat establishment guide. If you use another method of getting the site ready, that's fine too. But um, this is just kind of shows you, you know, it's gonna take you a full year to get a site prepared um, and that's if you're using herbicide and going with maybe this, um, the soybean method, that's a year. Uh, if you're going to go non-herbicide, uh, probably take you a little bit longer to get that site more prepared uh, just because it's harder to get rid of the annual weeds and very, very, very hard to get rid of grasses. Grasses are our most difficult um, to work in. It's just, just very hard to get rid of the grasses enough so that you can get those pollinator plants started because it takes a good two years of them kind of being with a little bit elbow room and and being sparse out there. So it takes them a while. And grass usually tries to take it over immediately. So so that's just an example of, of a timeline that you could uh, follow on your planting. Oh, and being a member of the Seed Legacy Program, we this year had a limited offer working with our friends at Monarch Joint Venture, um, we had an offer of you buying uh, three trays of milkweed plugs for $75, which is a huge discount. Um, we wrote a grant, worked, uh, worked out some of the details there, and we're able to send a bunch of our cooperators these plugs um, to supplement their plantings that they'd already done. So that's one benefit that we will probably continue in the future because it certainly was well received, I think. Uh, just an example of one of our sites. And I just want to show you some pictures of some of our sites. This one has a lot of ragweed in it, but it's a first year project site. It needed to be mowed when it was a lot shorter, but it didn't get mowed. But um, here's a first year honeybee planting. This is a second year monarch planting. Another honeybee planting, a beekeeper with a beautiful little German shorthair pointer. And you can see in the distance, the yellow, that's his uh, honeybee planting there. There's black eyed Susans. Um, a second year project with a monarch planting. Also another monarch planting. Um, honeybee mix. And that plant there, I'm going to go back to so this really pretty purple plant. When it comes up in your planting, you're going to go, what's that? That's called Phasalia. And it is an actual bee bomber, I call it. Um, the bees just love it. Absolutely. Any bumblebee, 
uh, within a million miles will be on top of that facelia. And the honeybees love it too. So it's a really neat plant that we include. And this is a three-year-old uh, butterfly mix. And here's one that's right next to a soybean field. Uh, you can have these quality plantings right next to agriculture. Not really a problem. And here's one of the sites, um, one of the solar synergy type sites, uh, the renewable energy sites. So what can you do? Um, we really would love it if you'd promote opportunities for projects. We have people calling us all the time that want to do a project maybe in a city park or um, corporate campus or, you know, or just a landowner project. Um, we always want the opportunity to do more projects. Uh, you can co-host if you have a group and you would like us to put on a pollinator webinar for a group. Uh, maybe you could co-host that. You could introduce us and, and bring us into your whatever group that might be. Um, distribute our flyers. Uh, we can send you a PDF of our flyers and you can distribute them. Say if you're at a, a an event, if you're sitting there at the, I don't know, this anywhere really i mean you could you just have a, a an event local event or um, anywhere you're at you know we'd be happy to send you flyers so that you could could promote the program um, our gift that grows program or even just making a gift and a donation in somebody's name that money goes right back into putting habitat on the ground for one of these projects um, so you can do that through our program that we call gifts that grow and then follow us on social media, you know, share our stuff. We, we're always happy to get the added interest from folks that uh, find us on social media. And here's how you can contact us, uh, info at beingbutterflyfund.org. We're really excited that you could be here tonight with us. Thank you.